All right, let's dive in. We're tackling large operation farms all across the U.S. today. Yeah, the ones that keep the whole country fed. And, uh, yeah, you know, it's not all just those endless cornfields you see in pictures. Right, right. There's a lot more to it than that. Yeah, a lot more than just cornfields in the Midwest. Ha ha. <laughs> it's easy to, you know, picture that kind of like quaint family farm when you think of well, where your food comes from. But these farms, these big operations, they're a completely different thing altogether. And they're really key for keeping up with how much food we need these days. Okay, so let's start with something I think we all can picture, right? Hay farms. I always thought of hay as, I don't know, just hay, like it's all the same. Yeah. But looking at all this, it really depends on where in the country you are. I mean, the stuff a hay farm in Minnesota has to deal with versus one in Georgia, those are like <laughs> total opposites. Oh, absolutely. The climate's huge. Think about it. A farm in Minnesota, they've got snow, they've got freezing temps for a good chunk of every year. So they got to have these giant stockpiles of hay alfalfa, timothy, stuff like that, to get their livestock through the winter. That means massive round ballers, tractors that can handle the snow, storage barns you could probably fit a small airplane in, ha <laughs> ha. It's like straight out of a winter wonderland movie, but with bales of hay instead of giant snowdrifts. <laughs> and then in the southeast, you've got all that warmth and humidity. And I was actually surprised to learn they're growing different types of hay down there, Bermuda grass, things like that. And it seems like down there, the focus is on managing the pasture land and making sure the livestock have enough shade to stay out of the sun. It really all comes down to, well, adapting to whatever that environment throws at you. Silage farms. Hmm. I had to look that one up, actually. It's basically fermented feed, like uh, like pickled veggies for cows. Ha <laughs> ha. And it seems like it's a pretty big deal, especially for dairy farms. Oh, yeah. Silage is a huge part of dairy, especially in that whole Midwest dairy belt, Wisconsin, Iowa, Michigan, all those. And those mm. farms use all the specialized equipment like choppers to harvest corn and alfalfa. Then they pack it all into these giant silos to ferment. It's a whole process. It's pretty cool. And get this. One of the sources actually had a story about a dairy farm in Arizona that uses solar panels solar panels to power their whole silage operation blew my mind. Who would have thought you could connect solar energy and, you know, cow food? <laughs> yeah, that's what I think is so interesting about these large operations. They're always innovating, especially when it comes to, well, trying to be sustainable. That Arizona dairy farm you mentioned, that's a perfect example. They've got a dry climate, so they have to work around that. And on top of that, they're figuring out ways to, well, reduce their impact on the environment. Pretty impressive, I'd say. Okay. So we've got pickled cow food. But what about, well, regular food, right? Got to talk about the green farms. I mean, those pictures, the ones with like seemingly never-ending fields of corn and soybeans, that's pretty much American agriculture, right? Yeah, there's a reason those are so iconic. That Midwest green belt, you know, with I Iowa, Illinois, all those states, they're producing tons and tons of corn and soybeans. And it all ends up well, everywhere. Your cereal, the feed for the animals we eat. Mm -hmm. It's mind-boggling how much they grow. I know. The sources had some crazy photos of these combines harvesting the grain. They look like spaceships compared to like the tractors you see around here. And then they had these huge grain bins. Looks like they could hold a whole city block. It's a very um, <laughs> mechanized system, that's yeah. for sure. Very efficient. But what really impressed me was how grain farms in other parts of the country, like uh, the High Plains of Texas and Oklahoma, those areas, they've adapted to drought conditions. They're growing crops that can handle the lack of water. And implementing all these water conservation methods, it's really remarkable what they're doing. So even within grain farms, there's all this variety, yeah. different approaches, different challenges. It makes you realize, you know, there's no one way to do large scale agriculture. Exactly. It's all about adapting. And that's where those sustainable practices like crop rotation and no till farming, those become so important. And it's not just about being eco friendly. It's about protecting the soil, saving water mm. and making sure those farms can keep producing food for, well, a long time to come. Yeah. Yeah. It's a real balancing act, you know, trying to grow as much as possible, but but also thinking about the land in the long run. You know what surprised me? All the different types of oil seed crops out there. I mean, soybeans, sure, those are everywhere. But the sources mentioned canola, sunflowers, even flax. Oh, yeah. Oil seeds are used for all sorts of things. Most people think of cooking oil, but they're also really important for animal feed. And they use them in all kinds of industrial stuff, too. It's pretty wild to think, like, a sunflower grown in North Dakota could end up as fuel for a car in California. That whole connection between the farm and what we do every day keeps coming up. It's easy to forget about where our food comes from when you're just at the store. But then you start thinking about that journey, right. you know, from the field all the way to your table. It really puts things in perspective. 
It's all about understanding how complex that system really is. And speaking of complex systems, let's get back to livestock for a minute. Forage farms. These are the farms that grow crops specifically to feed animals. And just like with the other types of farms, what they grow depends a lot on where they are in the country. This is where I really got into it. The sources actually had a map showing all the different kinds of forage grown across the U.S. So the Northeast, you know, with that cooler, wetter climate, it's all alfalfa, different grasses, and clover. But then you go down south to the southeast, and it gets warmer. And boom, it's all Bermuda grass. It's like the whole forage landscape totally changes as you go across the country. And you know what? Those regional differences in what they grow, that affects the quality of the meat and dairy we're eating. <laughs> it's pretty interesting to think about, right? A cow eating alfalfa in Vermont, that's going to produce different milk than a cow eating Bermuda grass in Florida. It all boils down to, well, the nutrients in those forages. Okay, now this is where I need some help. The sources mentioned something called rotational grazing and also cover cropping. They said these are important for making forage production sustainable, but I'm not really sure what those mean. Oh, happy to explain. So rotational grazing, it's basically where farmers move their livestock around between different pastures on a regular schedule. That way they avoid overgrazing, let the plants come back, and it actually makes the soil healthier in the long run. It's good for the animals, good for the environment. So instead of letting the cows eat everything in one spot, they get moved around like a buffet, but the menu is always changing. Uh -huh. Yeah, something like that. So what about cover cropping? What's that all about? So with cover cropping, farmers plant certain crops just to help the soil, not to harvest them or anything. They might plant clover, rye, vetch, things like that. And these cover crops, they help stop erosion, keep the weeds down, and they even put nutrients back into the soil. It's like giving the land a nice spa day. This is so much more complex than I ever thought. It's not just planting and harvesting. There's this whole ecosystem management side to it. I never really thought about that before. And that's what makes these large farms so complex, so interesting. We've covered a lot of ground in this deep dive, mm -hmm. from the hay fields up north to the dairy farms out in the desert. Yeah. And it's clear that there's no one right way to do large scale agriculture. Yeah, it's amazing the sheer scale of it all, how complex it is. We've talked about all this high-tech machinery. At the heart of it all, there are people, farmers, who are connected to the land, and they're dedicated to feeding all of us. I used to think of these large farms as just, I don't know, faceless businesses. But this deep dive has totally changed how I see them. It's all about understanding what's really going on. Right, they are businesses, that's true. But they're also rooted in tradition, in innovation, and a real commitment to taking care of the land. It's a fascinating balance. All the fancy equipment. Farming still takes skill and experience. And a lot of patience. For sure. And it looks like teamwork is key, too. Definitely. They've got each person with their own expertise. I feel that. But let's shift gears for a second and talk about the different types of hay. Your source on bale types mentioned alfalfa, timothy, and clover. Each one has a different, like, nutritional profile. Uh, yeah, that's important. It's got to match the needs of the animals you're feeding. Right. It's like choosing the right food for your pet. Mm. You wouldn't feed a dog the same thing you'd feed a cat. Exactly. Different animals, different diets. And that brings us to the different types of bales. So we've got small round bales. Those are popular for horses. Then there are medium round bales. And then the big guys, the large round bales. And don't forget about square bales. Oh, right, the square bales. They seem to be all about making storage and transport easier. Yeah, it looks like there's a bale for every need and every farm size. It's all about finding the right fit. Absolutely. And then there's the whole process of making the bales. Your notes on small round bales mention something called the one-tenth bloom stage for alfalfa. What is that? Oh, that's interesting. Basically, when about 10% of the alfalfa plants have started to flower, that's when they say it's at the one-tenth bloom stage. And why is that important? Well, that's when alfalfa has the most nutrients. Ah, uh, so it's all about timing to get the most nutritious hay. You got it. I see. And there's this image of these round bales all wrapped up in plastic. Oh, yeah, that's called wrapping or balage. It helps preserve the hay. Especially if it's a little wet when they bale it. Okay, so it's not just about keeping it dry. Not exactly. The plastic wrap creates this environment where the hay ferments. Kind of like pickling. Really? So it's like controlled rotting? Well, not rotting exactly. It's more like a controlled fermentation. It preserves the nutrients and makes the hay taste better to the animals. Oh, interesting. So they're getting more out of the hay. That's the idea. Clever. Mm. So it's like they're creating a mini ecosystem inside each bale. You could say that. 
And speaking of different types of hay, your source mentioned Timothy hay as being like a good all-purpose option. What makes it so versatile? Well, Timothy hay has a good balance of protein and fiber, and it's low in sugar. Okay. So it's good for a lot of different animals, mm -hmm. from horses to cows to rabbits. Wow, that's a wide range. It is. And it's especially good for animals that have sensitive stomachs. So it's like the Goldilocks of hay. Not too rich, not too bland. Exactly. Just right. Just right. But enough about the hay itself. Let's talk about the tools of the trade. We've got some intro here on equipment attachments that can really boost efficiency on a hay farm. Oh, yeah. The equipment is crucial. It's what makes everything possible. We're talking bale handlers, brush mowers, all sorts of cool stuff. Those bale handlers look like they could lift a car. I know, right? They're impressive. But how do farmers decide which attachments are right for them? Well, it depends on a few things, like the size and weight of the bales they're handling. You don't want a bale handler that's too small or it could break. Right, you need the right tool for the job. Exactly, and the terrain matters too. Some attachments are better for rough ground than others. I see, makes sense. And speaking of the right tool for the job, we've got some info here on a company called Messer Attachments. They seem to specialize in equipment for cattle farms. Yeah, they've got some interesting stuff, like this system they developed for handling small square bales. It's called the 21 square bale configuration. Ooh, 21 square bale configuration, what is that? Well. It's a specific way of stacking the bales, so they're really stable and easy to move and store. 21 bales, is there something special about that number? Well, it's all about geometry. Uh. 21 bales create this interlocking pattern that's really strong. Huh, interesting. So it's not just about stacking them neatly. Nope, there's a science to it. I see. Do you have any examples of this in action? Actually, yeah, they have a case study from this farm in Kansas, the Thompson family farm. Okay. And after they started using this 21 bale method, they saw a 30% reduction in their fuel costs. Wow. And a 50% increase in their storage capacity. That's huge. It is, plus they had less hay spoilage. So it's like a win, win, win. Pretty much. But I imagine there's some downsides too, right? Well, you need special equipment to handle these 21 bale stacks and it might not be the best option for every farm. Right, it's not a one size fits all solution. Exactly. You gotta weigh the pros and cons. And figure out what works best for your specific situation. Makes sense. And that brings us to the bigger picture. Regional differences in hay farming across the U.S. Ah, uh, yes. Hay is not just hay. It varies a lot depending on where you are. Really? I mean, does it really matter where you grow it? Oh, it definitely matters. The climate, the soil, the types of livestock they raise, all of that influences what kind of hay they grow and how they farm it. So what are some of the key differences we see? Well, let's take the Midwest, for example. They're known for their corn, but they also produce a lot of alfalfa hay. Well, the climate and soil there are perfect for alfalfa, and it's a main feed for dairy cows, which are really common in the Midwest. So the type of hay is tied to the type of livestock? Often, yes. Interesting. What about other regions? Well, the southeast is different. It's warmer and more humid there, so it's harder to grow alfalfa. I see. They focus more on warm season grasses, like Bermuda grass and Bahia grass. So each region has its own hay specialty? You could say that. Fascinating. What about equipment? Does that vary by region too? Definitely. In hilly areas, they might need special equipment for working on slopes. And in dry areas, irrigation is really important. Right. And the size of the farm matters too. Smaller farms might do more things by hand, while large farms use these huge machines. Wow, so it's a whole ecosystem of farming practices. It is. Adapted to the specific region. Exactly. It's amazing how adaptable farmers are. They have to be to deal with all the challenges they face. You really do. Now we have this data here breaking down hay production by region in the US. And all the knowledge you've gained from this deep dive. You mean all the fascinating details about hay types and bale sizes mm -hmm. and equipment and regional differences? Mm -hmm. It's a lot to take in. It is. But it's important to connect this information to your own context. So imagine you're starting a hay farm in your region. Okay, I'm picturing it now. Mm. Rolling hills, sunshine, the smell of fresh cut hay. Now, given everything you've learned, what would your ideal setup be? What kind of hay would you grow? What bale size would you choose? What equipment would you need? Hmm, that's a great question. It really makes you think. I'd definitely go for, well, it's hard to say. Huh. There's so much to consider. I know, right? It's a complex decision. It is, but it's a fun thought experiment. Absolutely, it helps you appreciate all the factors involved in hay production. It does. And the expertise of the farmers who do this every day. Should make it look easy, but there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. 
That's the truth. So I guess the moral of the story is don't take your hay for granted. Exactly. It's more than just dried grass. Right. It's the result of a lot of hard work and knowledge mm. and careful planning. Well said. And maybe a little bit of luck. Always a little bit of luck in farming. That's for sure. But hey, that's what makes it exciting. It does. And that's what keeps us coming back for more. Speaking of coming back for more, we've got a lot more to cover in this deep dive. We do. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. After a short break, and it helps to keep the hay from getting moldy or mildewy, too. Oh, that's good. So it stays fresh longer. Yeah, that's a good goal. Okay, so we've talked about wrapping, which is pretty cool. But what about Timothy Hay? You mentioned that earlier as being a good all-around choice. Why is that? Well, Timothy Hay is kind of like the middle ground. Huh. It's got moderate protein and fiber, and it's low in sugar. Okay. So it's good for a lot of different animals. Like what? Horses, cattle, rabbits, guinea pigs. Wow, so it's pretty versatile. It is, and it's a good choice for animals that have sensitive digestion. Ah, so it's gentle on their stomachs. Exactly. That makes sense. So it's like the Goldilocks hay, not too much of anything. Right. It's right. But enough about the hay itself. Let's move on to the equipment. You know, the tools of the trade. But how do farmers know which attachments are right for them? It depends on a few factors. The size of their operation, the type of hay they're producing, the terrain they're working on. So it's like choosing the right tool for the job. Exactly. You wouldn't use a hammer to screw in a screw. Yep. And you wouldn't use a screwdriver to pound in a nail. Right. You need the right tool for each task. Exactly. And speaking of the right tool for the job, Messer attachments. They seem to specialize in equipment for cattle farms. They do. They've got some pretty innovative stuff. Like what's... Speaking of different operations, let's talk about regional differences in hay farming across the U.S. Uh, yes. The Great Hay Divide. I mean, hay is hay, right? Well, not exactly. Hay production varies a lot depending on where you are. Really? Uh, I didn't realize it was that different. Oh, it is. The climate, the soil, the types of livestock. All of that influences what kind of hay they grow and how they grow it. So what are some of the key differences we see? Well, let's take the Midwest, for example. Okay. They're known for their corn and soybeans, but they also produce a lot of alfalfa. Alfalfa. Yeah, alfalfa is a really important hay crop, especially for dairy cows. Which are common in the Midwest. Exactly. So the type of hay is tied to the type of livestock. It often is. What about other regions? Well, the Southeast is different. It's warmer and more humid there, so alfalfa doesn't grow as well. I see. They tend to focus more on warm season grasses, like Bermuda grass and Bahia grass. So each region has its own hay specialty. You could say that. That's pretty cool. What about equipment? Does that vary by region too? Definitely. In hilly areas, they might need special equipment for working on slopes. And in drier areas, irrigation is really important. And mm -hmm. the size of the farm matters too. Smaller farms might do more things by hand, while large operations might use huge machines. Wow. So it's a whole system. It is. Adapted to the local condition. Exactly. That's amazing. It is. Farmers are really good at adapting to their environment. They have to be. Be successful. So we've got this data here on hay production by region in the U.S., but I'm curious, do these same ideas apply in other parts of the world? I think they do. The specific types of hay might be different, but the basic principles are probably the same. So it's like a universal language of farming. I like that analogy. With different dialects. Exactly. Each region has its own way of speaking the language. That's a great way to put it. So 